This podcast does not constitute an endorsement by the United States Army or Department of Defense. Welcome back to the Soldier for Life podcast, and I'm your host, Lieutenant Colonel Olivia Nunn. And today we have an organization that many of you guys may know, and those that you haven't, you're going to find out. And it's Hiring Our Heroes, which is part of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. And today we have Eric Eversole, the president of Hiring Our Heroes, and Meredith Lazar, Lazor, executive director of programs and events at Hiring Our Heroes. So Thank you so very much for you guys spending time with us here at Soldier for Life and digging in about Hiring Our Heroes. Glad to be here. Thanks for having us. So Hiring Our Heroes, most people know the name of that organization when we talk about the DOD's skill bridge opportunity. And then the Army, we call that the Career Skills Program. Um, it seems like Career skills, DOD skill bridge tends to go synonymous with hiring our heroes, but hiring our heroes is just one facet of that. So, Eric, can you tell me what exactly is hiring our heroes? Yeah, hiring our heroes is a national grassroots organization that's committed to helping uh, our transitioning service members, veterans, and military spouses find meaningful careers. And then we really do that through our vast network of state and local chambers, our connection with the business community both big companies and small companies, to really create an environment where um, our population of service members and veterans and their families can really thrive in making connections, having the right skill sets, understanding what they need to do to get ready, and then making it happen. So uh, we've been in existence a little over a decade now, um, huge fans of Soldier for Life and what Soldier for Life has been doing for the Army. Uh, in that last decade, we've been in lockstep with the Army on this. Uh, and and really, you know, it, it's really about uh, private and, and public partner uh, partnerships that are really going to make it happen for our transitioning service members and military spouses. So Hiring Our Heroes not only works with our transitioning service members, who else does Hiring Our Heroes work with in terms of when we're talking about the military community or or the service members? Well, I'm going to let Meredith talk a little bit about that. But, you know, it's, it's really, you know, we're, we're going to take a, a, a broad view uh, of military connected talent, um, you know, and, and that often, you know, obviously that's very clear for transitioning service members and veterans. Uh, but uh, that also includes a, a pretty broad net of military spouses. Uh, we're not afraid to help their children either. You know, you know, this is about understanding that that the military connected community um, often sacrifice a lot to be a part of that community. Uh, And what we want to make sure of is that they're not sacrificing economic opportunity as a result of their service. So uh, let me, let me let Meredith chime in because uh, this is right in her wheelhouse. Well, and thanks for that, Eric. And I, and that's very well said. I mean, for us, we have a very broad brush. So Hiring Our Heroes not only serves transitioning service members and veterans, but also military spouses and those who stand behind the men and women who are, who are in uniform. And for us, the really fantastic thing is a military spouse is defined as anyone who's had their career affected by military service. So you can be a widow, you can be an actively serving spouse, you can be a veteran spouse, You can be a retiree, a divorcee, or a fiance. Broad Brush really allows us to serve so many more than we would be had we had a really restricted definition. I like that you have a very broad definition of what it means to be part of that military community. And like you've mentioned, the military community sacrifices a lot, especially those that don't necessarily wear the uniform, right? The backbone of that service member, which is that family. So more specifically... We know that it's about gainful employment and and opportunities and economic opportunity, which translates to money and a job. So let's start at the very beginning. Hiring Our Heroes gets into that realm and into that world of being able to fully employ our service members, finding that meaningful connection. So Meredith, I'm going to start with you. 
How does it all start? Where should, where should our listeners go and what should they be doing? So that's a great question. And for many of our listeners, it'll start in a transition readiness or a tap class where they're going to learn about the opportunities that are available to them as they look to leave service and go on to veteran life. So they'll hear about hiring our heroes many times during those kinds of courses. But on top of that, it starts by joining Hiring Our Heroes for things like pre summit seminars, where they're going to get professional development classes, learn how to network virtually on LinkedIn. They'll learn a little bit more about their resume. They'll do interview prep. So it's all those skills and building that confidence to go into interviews and feel really great about what you bring to the table. And it's also about translating the skills that you have. And we're certainly not the only ones who do that. So we look at as our opportunity to be an extension of the services that are already provided, or maybe even a force multiplier, if you'd like to use that term, because we're going to provide that little bit more. And we do it alongside over 300 employer partners who are committed to hiring veteran and military staff talent. So they're going to look you guys up, go to your website. They're going to start applying. So how does the program actually work? Because there's one thing that's very specific to Hiring Our Heroes that a lot of other uh, skill bridge opportunities that are slightly different, and that is cohort base. So turning it over to you, Eric, what is this cohort base? Why cohort base? And and how does that matter? Or why does it matter? Yeah, you know, when you're talking about the fellowship program, and I I think one thing that does make us different even before the cohort is we're going to, our team is going to invest in, in that service member, that military spouse, before they even apply to the program. You know, the first thing they're going to do is connect with what we call a career connector that's going to help them ask really important, but sometimes really difficult questions. What do you want to do and where do you want to live? Because that greatly impacts, you know, the decision-making matrix. And you know, I've often heard service members say, well, I'll, you know, I'll live anywhere. And I'm like, OK, well, I have a great opportunity for you. And, and you know, I'm near the Canadian border. What do you think? They're like, oh, I'm, I don't want to live there. But I'm like, you don't want to live anywhere. And, and, you know, that's part of what our team is going to do from an initial investment perspective is really, you know, invest and help you ask those t- tough questions. You know, and, and they're going to help help that person navigate through the application uh, and decide, okay, you know, as you mentioned, Colonel Nunn, uh, what are the, you know, what's a cohort going to be? When does your transition timeline line up so that we can make sure that you're in the right cohort? Now, our cohorts are really, you know, like basic training classes. Uh, you know, it's your platoon. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to put you in a, a cohort that has defined dates for the most part, Uh, where, you know, three times a year, we launch our basic training cohorts, our our skill bridge uh, fellowship programs. Uh, We do it across uh, 17 different locations in the United States. Um, And it has a start date, it has training associated with it, and it has a graduation associated with it. So I wouldn't think of it much differently than what you, you know, thought about your, your military service, quite candidly, because, you know, the, the point of this is not just to say, hey, look, Joe or Jane, you go figure this out on your own. You can do that in the job market by yourself, right? The reason the career skills program is so valuable, and I think why, you know, our fellows program does this so well, is we're going to keep you with your brothers and sisters in arms and military spouses in a tight-knit community, and we're going to Put you with a host company, one of more than 400 host companies that currently are part of the program. We're going to do that, but you're going to spend four days a week with them. And on the fifth day, you're going to come back with your cohort to talk about what you've learned about your experience. Because we know that, you know, military members, especially if you've never had a job in the civilian sector, you can be um, you, you have a tendency to say this isn't how it was in the military. And you don't know if it's good or bad. Right. You just don't. And, you know, things like um, people showing up late for meetings, uh, that's not common in the military. Right. It's common in the civilian sector. And, you know, it doesn't mean it's a bad company. It doesn't mean it's a good fit. But if you're around other people who are sharing that same experience with you, then you can ask the questions that you wouldn't otherwise want to ask. So it's really about creating, you know, keeping 
that military connectedness and uh, as you go through this, the, the skill bridge program and the pipeline that makes it so valuable, um, you know, look, you know, internships going off, being on your own, they're really great. You know, that gives you a leg up, but we, we think there's a special advantage to really keeping people uh, in their military community for this 12 week process as part of their cohort so that they can ask the questions of, of their cohort mates that they wouldn't want to ask their employer. And that's okay. You know, so I want to make sure that I clearly articulate this on this episode. So career, DOD Career Skills Program or the Army um, or Skill Bridge or Career Skills Program is designed for a transitioning service member in their last six months of service, whether you're ETSing or retiring. And if you are in the Army, because you are listening to the Soldier for Life podcast, the military rules for the army is that you cannot have a, a uh, career skill or a, a DOD skill bridge no longer than four months. That is the maximum length of time. So six months is your start date before you can actually take part of it. And you only have at maximum four months. What I've typically seen in the army is that most commanders sign off around a three month internship is what we typically see. And I'd like to also articulate that uh, hiring our heroes, from what I believe, you you come in through this cohort the, based on your program. I believe the selection is done through your program. Uh, but there is an option for service members in the Army and other branches where you can select an individual organization. You could do a one-on-one, which is what I did. I went to MOA, Military Officers Association of America. So there are choices. So getting back to hiring our heroes about that that 12-week program, and, and coming all together and being able to share within that tribe. What does that look like when you're a military spouse? So I want to turn this over to you, Meredith. Does the same apply to military spouses? Is it different? What does it mean when we're talking to the spouse side of the house? Yeah, that's a great question. So the wonderful part about the service member side is that doing that 12 week fellowship with us, they are still paid by the DOD because they're still on active duty. And this is a part of their transition out. As a military spouse, you don't have that option. There's not that DOD backbone. So there are two options for military spouses. And I'm really excited to say that we're looking to add more in the future. So this is a very thriving and growing program. If you're a military spouse and you're interested in doing a fellowship with us, you have two avenues that you can take. One is very similar to the corporate fellowship program. The only difference is that it's a six week internship program. So it is not as long as the corporate fellowship program, which takes that 12 week time frame. So it's a six week opportunity, which you are assigned to a company during that time. Again, over 300 employer partners to choose from. We will match you on our end to make sure that you receive the best opportunity. And companies will tell us also who they are looking for. So it's kind of a inside matching process so that we get the best fit for all. Then they'll go into that six week cohort. So every Friday they are coming back to us along with other military spouses in that same cohort cohort fashion, getting professional development. And then at the end of the six weeks, we have an odor over 86% placement rate. So those military spouses are securing employment through these opportunities. And it's about a $70,000 offer rate as well, which means it's a fantastic opportunity for you if you're a military spouse. The second option is to go through a 12-week fellowship program with us focused on Salesforce. So this is a program that you would enter into after achieving your certificate in Salesforce. And it's open not only to military spouses, but also to transitioning service members and veterans. So you can have already transitioned out of the Army or any other branch of service and just decide that you're ready to upskill or reskill to another industry and get your Salesforce certificate and then come and join us for this 12-week fellowship. And that program has an 88% placement rate and a starting salary rate of $88,000. So it's a fantastic program for those who are interested in a tech field. That's really good news to hear. And I'm glad that we're starting to, not that we haven't started, we've been doing this for, we as collectively, the military community, along with um, government resourcing, as well as even policy, looking at effectively hiring the talent that we have in our military spouses because they give up a lot, right? They move from zip code to zip code. A lot of them have degrees of their own, but yet, you know, it's hard for them to find employment. Oh, by the way, many of them are at home raising the children as the service members off into the field or deployments. So excited that there's work being done there. 
so now we are looking at hiring our heroes as this this program. And Eric, you had mentioned that this is about ten years in the making, right? In terms of uh, there was a there was work that was done initially on between the U.S. Army Soldier for Life program and with hiring our heroes. Let's go back to the early days. Was Hiring Our Heroes always part of the Chamber of Commerce? Where is that relationship and, and where did this idea come from? Yeah, you know, I, you know, it's always been a part of the Chamber and, and really it's a part of its foundation. So it's it's, it's charitable giving arm. And, you know, it, it started um, back in 2011 when our country was facing a crisis, primarily in veteran unemployment. Uh, we had segments of the overall transitioning population uh, that were facing uh, uh, transitioning service members under the age of 25, had a nearly 30% unemployment. So we had a lot of young soldiers who were being deployed, coming back uh, you know, from war zones and finding an absolutely horrible job market. And so from the chamber's perspective, you know, we, we saw this very significant number of, of service members, especially transitioning service members, veterans who were facing a, a tough job market. And we said, look, what's the one thing the U.S. Chamber of Commerce can do right now to make a difference? And that was to leverage our you know, broad network of state and local chambers to host hiring events. Uh, and we did nearly 800 hiring events in about the first three years. I mean, it was literally about connecting local employers, local communities, unemployed veterans, military spouses, service members with these great companies who were going to uh, make a commitment to hiring them. Um, you know, and, and, you know, this is at the same time we were also seeing, uh, and I'll just give a plug for the Army here, you know, it was the same time that the Army was seeing some downsizing numbers as well. So it was bad, you know, in 2011. We knew it was going to continue to be challenging in the near term, and, 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 and we're very thankful to have leaders like General Odierno, who was the chief of staff, and General John Campbell, who was a vice at the time, say, look, we're going to take care of these young men and women, you know, and make sure that on their way out that we're going to honor their service and, and help ensure that they get employment opportunities. That's about the time Soldier for Life was created, and it was part of that response and understanding that, you know, um, no one can – there's no silver bullet here. Uh, and it's really about private and public partnerships, um, organizations like the chamber working in lockstep with the Army and DOD to say, you know, hey, look, we got great employers on our side of this this ledger. You have great talent on your side. Let's let's partner up and, and make a big difference. And, and that's really, you know, where it started and, and where it is now. And it's evolved. And I think that's great. You know, I- as you're talking about the history and, you know, the work that our senior leaders did, particularly in the Army, and General Odierno had this great idea, and Soldier for Life was born from this. You know, there's obviously the staff did their great job, right? Staffers did their job well and, and wrote some white papers and presented this well. But, it, you know, that that baseline work has created a pathway for us today, almost a decade later, in terms of making sure that we effectively message the value of a veteran. And not only is it the value of the veteran, but also the value of the military spouse. So let me leave this with you, uh, Meredith. What is the one last thing you'd really like our listeners to know about hiring our heroes in the work that you're doing, the program or anything else? Oh, that's such a tough question. If there's one lesson that I wanted our, our listeners to know, I would say that, um, Hiring Our Heroes is dedicated to creating economic opportunity for you. And there are many different avenues that we take to do that. What we know is that your career path after a life of service or supporting service as a military spouse is not one size fits all. So Hiring Our Heroes has many avenues that you can take, whether it's a fellowship that we've talked so much about today, or whether it's joining us for things like professional development or a military spouse network in your community, or even attending a hiring event that's industry focused to make sure it delivers on what you need. You know, it's an individualized approach as Eric talked about, and we think that's the recipe for success. I love that. Love the work that is being done out there in the military community. And more importantly, that. Uh, partnerships are happening. Um, that's how we're going to get after any problem. And that's how we're going to fix it is 
by community. So thank you so very much, both Eric and Meredith, for spending your time with Soldier for Life and, and digging in and telling us a little bit more about hiring our heroes, but more importantly, the work that is being done right now for our military community. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Once a soldier, always a soldier, a soldier for life. <laughs>